So starting out with IP strategy. First question is always, what are your goals? I'll assume that your principal goal is to make and sell products. You want to attract investment. And you want to create some assets that even if you don't use them, may be profitable to your company, that you can license them or sell them. What do you need for those goals? Number one, a market. If there's no market for the products based on your technology, your company is going to have a very rough go of it. Your technology, your products, and your potential market are the things that have the most value. Importantly, and we'll spend a little more time on this later, you have to avoid third-party claims. If people start rushing in, waving their patents or anything else, your company has a serious business problem. And you also are going to need agreements, and you're going to need a lot of them, to make sure that everything is working the way you want it to, and frankly, in a way that's fair to the people you're working with. And what does IP potentially add to all of this? Let's start off with agreements. There are th lots of them, as I said, but there are three that are probably the most important. The first is assignment agreements. Who assigns what to whom and what rights remain with either party? Confidentiality. You've, most of you have seen some of those, and you probably don't like them much because they seem to bind you, and they do. They can go a long, long way. And finally, non-competes. Unless you're living in California, and I didn't know until I looked it up a few days ago, or North Dakota, non-compete agreements are valid at one level or another in every state in this country. All three of these are important. You'll always be asked to sign confidentiality and assignment. You'll probably be asked to sign non-competes. And you're probably not going to have a heck of a lot of ability to negotiate or say, hey, I won't sign this. This is a sample assignment agreement. I agree to assign any inventions that I conceive or reduce to practice. Well, that's patentees. What it means is I have the idea or I do something to make the idea into reality. That I create either alone or with others during the course of my employment or as a result of my employment. In the course of is an interesting word. Does that mean during the term of your agreement? From the time you get up in the morning, the first day you go to work, until the time you go home, the last day you work there? Or does it mean while you're actually at your desk doing something? These assignments may vary. Some of them are limited to inventions that you do as part of your job, but some aren't. There are a lot of them that also have a presumption built in that anything you think of within a year of the time you leave my employee and go to work for somebody else, well, of course you thought of it or did some of it on my time, so I own it. Not a happy situation for either you or your new employer. And you obviously agree to execute on all kinds of papers, to cooperate, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth, but assignments you will have to deal with. Confidentiality, you're probably familiar with. You take, what is confidential information? You would like to, as an individual, have that be, oh, the most important trade secrets. The other side will want that to include everything up to and including the location of the cafeteria and the restroom. Somewhere in the middle, there's a happy medium, and that's going to have to be worked out because confidential information under these agreements, you promise you won't use it for anybody's benefit other than the people you're working for. You won't disclose it to anybody. And that doesn't mean just in precise words. It gets deeper than that. It's basically the basic idea. But confidentiality agreements with you, with companies, with consultants, with everybody you hire are normal, and you're going to have to learn to deal with them. Non-competes. This is where the fun really begins. You won't engage in any business while you're working for your employer that conflicts with theirs. Well, that's kind of expected. You expect to have a duty to the people with whom you're working and frankly paying you. But what after you quit? 
This one says, okay, for two years after I quit, I won't engage in anything that is similar to or in competition with the people I'm already working for. Where? This one says, in a geographical area within 100 miles of the radius of any office of the company, not simply the one that you're working in, or within a 100-mile radius of your home address. What home address? The one where you lived when you were working for the company, or the one you live now? Because you're obviously going to be working for somebody within 100 miles of where you're living. How many? So scopes of these are extremely important. And notice the two time frames. There always is a before and after. Fortunately, there are some limits on non-competes. As I mentioned a moment ago, they're simply not valid in North Dakota or California. A slightly different climate choice, perhaps, for you. In other states, the rule seems to be, what's a reasonable restriction? How much should it cover? What you do or what the company does? How long should it last? A year or two? Five years? Ten years? What levels of employees does it cover? There's been a tendency in recent years for it to cover absolutely everybody. I have a daughter-in-law who's a yoga instructor. And she was forced to sign a non-compete agreement in Singapore that for a period of, I believe, two or three years, said she couldn't work for any other yoga operation, including running her own shop, period. Query how many trade secrets she was really going to take with her, as opposed to, frankly, what she had learned on her own. If you're in Massachusetts, there is a new law, and it was the result of an awful lot of negotiation, say fights, and people who looked at it differently. It applies only to new agreements. If you have an agreement in effect now, it does not apply. It's only ones that go or signed after the first of next month. There are some people against whom it's not enforceable, and that is a big step forward for you and other employees. Number one is if you're terminated, if they decide to get rid of you, they can't enforce it. If you're under 18, and it's a long time since I've been there, they can't enforce it. This also, they said, you know this, applying non-competes against unpaid interns is simply not fair. Massachusetts also cut back the duration. How long can it last to 12 months? And in some fairness to the person who can't go out and do what they want to do, they have to provide some post-employment compensation, sometimes referred to as garden leave. Often the number that's thrown out is 50% of what you were being paid the last year or so you were on the job. It's a big step forward toward fairness. It's brand new. It hasn't been worked out here. If you like California weather, there are reasons to go there because there are no non-competes. Okay, who in the heck are these two guys? Johann Gutenberg, you probably have heard of. He did something with printing presses back, oh, 600 years ago. Brother Leo is kind of my invention, makes it a little more interesting. Brother Leo, at least in my version, is a monk down the road that Gutenberg hired to create a German language translation of the Latin Bible. And he basically did not save, as you can tell from the picture, the good wine for last. What Gutenberg did is probably credited with being one of the most important inventions, frankly, since the beginning of the Renaissance. Let's start off with what technology and know-how did he have? Because my theme all the way through here is it's your technology that is the most important. Your IP is simply to help you exploit that technology. He obviously had Brother Leo's translation. He had a press that he based on old wine presses. He had molds 
so he could make up all the individual little letters that he needed and make them up quickly. He figured out what a good alloy to use for the type was. Obviously, if it's too brittle, it's going to start baking. If it's too soft, it's going to start mushing all over the page. He had a good oil-based ink, and he had his name. In the 1400s, before there was any IP protection, was this enough for him to accomplish his business goals? To make money, to attract investors, and to have something he might be able to sell to people. He unfortunately, in the investor situation, he went through lots of them and ended up not doing too well. Let's suppose there weren't any IP. Would he have been able to print and sell his German language Bible? The answer is clearly yes. There was nothing preventing him from doing that. He had, or so we're going to assume, all the technology and know-how he needed to print it, to bind it. He had the translation. He had a good, decent press, at least for 1400, that was running just fine. No IP, him or anyone else. What are the risks? Major risk is obviously competition. The moment that first Bible hits the market, anybody can copy it. Anybody can look at it and probably tell it was printed. He's got employees. He had to tell how to make it, how to print it, probably what type of ink to use or what type of alloy. He's got Brother Leo out there who may decide, you know, you didn't pay me enough to make this translation. I can make a lot more different translations or I can simply sell this one to other people. He had a no-good brother-in-law in Berlin who was just waiting for him to be a success so he could use Gutenberg as a trademark too. Maybe unreligious artifacts, who knows. What could he have done in 1400 to reduce his risks? Unless some type of agreements were possible or he really trusted the people with whom he was working, the probable answer is not much. But he was able to print and market and sell as many as the market would bear. Now let's move forward 600 years. Let's pretend it's still a new invention. Would have IP helped him print books? I think the answer is clearly no. Would it have helped him to sell books? Not unless the advertising that says, so new, so great, it's patented, is really a great impetus for people to buy. So what might IP have done? And his basic ability to market and sell, probably zero. What does it do to potential competition? Maybe it prevents people from actually stealing his technology. Maybe it costs, now costs other people more money to get into the business. Force them to find substitutes for the exact molds and the exact ink and maybe the exact type of printing press that he's using. But IP is a two-headed coin. Because if you have it, other people have it. Might someone else have showed up with that stop what you're doing? Was Gutenberg really free to use that translation he got from Brother Leo? What about the metal alloy? Did anybody else have any IP rights in it, or in the paper, or in the ink, or in the press? There's a balance in IP, in IP world. IP can strengthen his market position, but it also can make him vulnerable to third party claims which is something that both Gutenberg had to, would have had to realize if he'd had IP around when he was doing this, and all of us have to realize and work with today. It's not only one way. There are basically four types of IP. They differ. Copyright, trade secrets, trademarks, and patents. They differ in their basis. 
in this country, copyright and patent are creatures of the U.S. Constitution. Trade secrets and trademarks basically grew up, just grew up in the legal system on what was a fair way to compete. It wasn't fair to steal somebody else's stickers. It wasn't fair to try to ride on their good name. What are the requirements for each? They differ. We'll get into that in a moment. How long does each last? Vastly different. Trade secrets and trademarks can go forever. Copyrights, thanks to Disney, now go longer than any of us will live. But patents have a fairly limited term. It's basically 20 years from the day you file the first patent application that you rely on. And it can be a long time between the date that's filed and the date that it finally issues. These aren't mutually exclusive. A single product can be protected by a lot of different types of IP. And let me use a really simple example, a bag of M&Ms. Anything copyrighted? Probably the design. Trademark? Certainly M&M. Trade secrets? You know there are all kinds of them wrapped up in exactly how do they get them so they don't melt too fast when they put it in their mouth and still taste good, and probably on the way they're actually made. Patents? Maybe something on the manufacturing. And if you go back to the 1920s, there is, was actually a patent on the shape of the bag. Long enough to fit in your palm and short enough so you could put the end into your mouth. And believe it or not, that patent issued, not for M&Ms, for peanuts, and was held valid. So what's a trademark? The definition is anything, word, name, that you use, and using it is important. You, and what do you use it for? You use it to distinguish what you're selling from what other people are. What are the requirements of it? It has to be sufficiently distinctive so it will actually, is capable of distinguishing sources. There are what are called generic marks. At one time in history, cellophane was a very, very strong trademark. And then the purchasing public came to know, it, know that as simply the name of this particular type of wrap you use to put things in the refrigerator. And because it is now the name of the product and not primarily to indicate from whom it comes, it no longer has any effect as a trademark. It's not a valid trademark. Thermos, the court kind of split the bottle. People began to know thermos. Did you really want to go to sell out in vacuum bottles to keep things hot and cold? No, everybody knew what a thermos bottle was. Court, in the wisdom of Solomon, hearing a case between the American thermos company and some competitor, decided, okay, guys, you were first. You can use a capital T. Everybody else can only use a small t. Fair? Perhaps, when you think about what the goal of a trademark is, it's to prevent people from riding on your good name, but still not to limit competition in product. Because the one thing that a trademark will not protect is the product itself. Trademarks are tied to products. Different people can use the same mark on different products. I don't think the purchaser of Cadillac cat food is going to think that it's made by General Motors. A little aside, company names and domain names are a little bit different. They don't really care what the product is. The goal for them is to make sure that somebody's domain name registry computer and a Secretary of State's computers don't hiccup because they've got two of the same names out there. You can have infinitesimal differences in the names, but no two companies in the state can really have exactly the same name, and no two companies can have exactly the same domain name, which has made some interesting efforts on people to register domain names abroad that they had nothing to do with, and then for a modest compensation, sell them back to the person to whom they were really interesting. 
your choice of a mark is very important for at least two reasons. The first is, if you're lucky, it is the thing by which you will become known. A few years ago, I was sitting, more years ago than I care to remember, next to a man who was then patent counsel for Gillette, and he happened to have a copy of their new annual report. And he was going down the balance sheet. And somewhere down the balance sheet, there was eh, half a million dollars labeled patents. He then pointed down to the net worth and said, that's our trademarks. And for a consumer company, that's true. So you want a name that is sufficiently distinctive that people will remember it. Maybe you want one that gives a hint of what you're doing so they'll know who in heaven's name are you and what might your product line be. But a name like Gutenberg is pretty weak because there are a lot of people who have a fair call on wanting to use Gutenberg. Trademark sweet for sugar? I can't give you that. People are entitled to call their sugar sweet. So again, as in a lot of this IP, it's a balance. Choose something that will help you, but not impede what in this case the trademark is intended not to impede, which is product competition. What's a trade secret? Basically, it's anything that might be valuable to your company that isn't generally known, can't be readily figured out by some simple back engineering once the product becomes public, and, and it's an important and, that you've taken some steps to keep it secret. The important thing to keep in mind about a trade secret is the information itself is not protected. All that is protected is the relationship between you and the person to whom you disclosed it under conditions of confidence. The only protection you have, and remember what the confidentiality agreement looked like, is that that person will not use what you gave them with the understanding they would keep it secret against you. There's no protection against anybody who develops the same trade secret, an identical one, independently. More than one person can have exactly the same tra trade secret, and it will be their trade secret, their plural, unless or until it becomes generally known. The other thing you have to keep in mind about trade secrets is trade secret rights are very easy to lose. A single disclosure to anybody that isn't accompanied by, and of course you'll keep it secret, either in writing or by clearly by the circumstances surrounding it, means it's no longer a trade secret. I can't disclose trade secrets to one person and then insist that all my employees keep the same information secret. It is simply not fair. Your patents, you want patents, presumably yes, lots of people want patents. They may, anything disclosed in a patent is obviously no longer a trade secret because that is now a publicly available document. Anything you put out in a learned journal is no longer a trade secret because that's publicly available. The product people may be able to back engineer and figure out what's going on. If somebody steals it from you and discloses it, he or she may be in trouble, but anybody else who learns of it independently can go ahead and use it and most of the cases I know say that that one that's been illegally disclosed effectively destroys the trade secret. VCs won't usually agree to keep your trade secrets secret. As a practical matter, they all say they'll do so, but if you have a track record where you ask them to keep it secret and they say, we don't do that, that is not a good sign because you, that anything you disclosed to them is still potentially a trade secret. What do you have to do with trade secrets? You got to keep your secrets secret and you have to make sure you don't use anybody else's. What's a copyright? Well anybody who is taking notes by virtue of writing it down has a copyright in the notes that they're taking. It's an original work of authorship, you wrote it down, you fixed it in a tangible mean medium of expression. You either took the notes or you 
put it into your computer. Doesn't take much creativity, unless you're trying to come up with an exact transcript of everything I'm saying, and I hope you're not. You've done enough in the original. You don't need to register that to get a copyright. You may need to register it if you want to sue on it in this country, but you don't need to register it just to get one. Bottom line problem on copyrights, assume that everything you read online, in a book, in a magazine, is copyrighted. You don't need a copyright notice anymore. The fact that there isn't one when I started out meant there's no copyright in this. That hasn't been true since the early 1970s in this country, and it's basically never been true in most of the major countries abroad. There are things you can't copyright. There is supposed to be a line drawn in the Constitution between what the Constitution calls science, that has nothing to do with technology, that's learning, that's knowledge, and inventions. Science is copyrights, inventions is patents. There's supposed to be lines between things that are useful and things that aren't useful. Those can get blurred. Is there anything more useful than software? Does anybody write software so someone will read it like a sonnet? Of course not. It's there, but you write it because of what it will do. A mechanical aspect of something is supposedly not subject to copyright. But as I said, those lines get to be very tenuous because, frankly, there's a lot of money and a lot of investment in software and similar things. And if some type of copyright protection isn't available, how are you going to protect that investment? What's a copyright protect? Only against copying. Read copying broadly. It doesn't have to be verbatim. One of the, when I was teaching, one of the examples I would always use is Romeo and Juliet and West Side Story. I doubt there is an identical line anywhere in the two, but the entire plot development and the characterizations are almost exactly the same. Does one infringe on the copyright of the other? If Romeo and Juliet was still in copyright, would Bernstein have been in trouble? Not a clear answer because it's a question of whether it was enough added, whether it's what the courts now call transformative, but that's the type of balance. It doesn't have to be verbatim. What it does say, you own the copyright, you can tell other people not to copy it. You can tell them not to come up with derivative works, query how far that goes, taking the Romeo and Juliet example, and you can distribute copies. What you can't control is what somebody, somebody does with the copyrighted work. Any information in that, they can use. It's free to use to everybody. Copyright will not protect the information or the data the way a patent will, or through the confidentiality, perhaps a trade secret. So it's not at all clear for a lot of businesses, how is a copyright really going to help you? Depending on the business that you're in, the answer could be not much, Maybe in some of the software businesses it could be quite a lot. What about somebody else's copyrights? Is that potentially a bigger problem? Because there's a great tendency, oh, I read it in this blog or on the internet, let's go ahead and copy it and use it. That's a problem. And convincing, educating all of your employees and all the people that you work with they can't do this willy-nilly. Because if they, if they do, you're very likely that somebody may, and I'm not gonna say they will, but they may say, hey, you infringed my copyright. Avoiding copyright infringement may be at least as important as copywriting your own stuff so somebody doesn't steal it. One of the big problems in copyright, and frankly, the same rules basically apply to inventors, it's okay, I hire a freelance software guy to write some programs for me. I paid him a lot of money. Who owns the copyright in that software? Absent some type of agreement, he or she does. 
The fact that you paid for it doesn't mean you own it. You can assign ownership, but if you don't, the author who wrote it is the original owner and they retain that ownership. You hear a lot about work for hire. And you have all kinds of contracts that say, this shall be considered a work for hire. Usually, those words aren't worth the ink it took to print them. The work for hire is very limited and specifically designed in the statute. It's basically something done by a regular employee within the scope of her employment. If they don't get a W-2 and this isn't part of their job, you do not own it as a, quote, employer who paid the money, as a work for hire. There's also a specially commissioned, but it's a very managed category. And if you don't own it, what type of license do you have to use it, even though you paid for it? <clears throat> this is particularly important to people like photographers and freelancers. The Feist case, that's, the Saini case that's cited here, was the New York Times, where basically a lot of photographers did stuff for, and you used to be a writer, did things for the New York Times. The New York Times wanted to go ahead, reuse them in different editions. And they said, hey, wait a minute. The only license we gave you was a single use, run it once, and then it's ours. And guess what? They won. Is that what you want to have if you're running a company? No. You want to be at least be sure that your license says you can do anything you want to with it. But what if you're the guy who's the photographer or the woman who's the author? Do you want to never be able to make any use of that writing or photo photographs again? Answer is, of course not. You need agreements, and hopefully, if you're the person who created it, you're in a position to create an agreement that, frankly, meets the fair interests of both parties. And the same basic rules apply to inventions. Just because you're employed, unless you're, quote, hired to invent, sort of work for hire, your employer doesn't own inventions that you make, absent some type of a written agreement. Copyrighted software. We've all gone out and bought God knows discs, or now we practically download them. We've all sent money to somebody for that. We don't own that software. One of the smartest things the software industry did was decide years and years ago that we aren't going to sell anything. Because under the existing well-established law across the board, once you sell something, you've got very little control over what you can do with it. So what do you get? You get a limited license that strictly limits what you can do with this software. Does this create a problem for you? It certainly can, because one of the things about it, suppose you want to create a competing product. You can't reverse engineer or decompile if it's software. You can't lend it out to anybody else. This can drastically limit what you can do with that software other than, frankly, use Word as it came to you so you can write a lot of papers that hopefully people will want to read. The rules are very different if you buy something, which we'll get into somewhat later when we start talking about patents. This is, in much too small print, exemplar of the, where the world is today on software. Years ago, it must be 20 years ago, John, Lotus? 20 years ago, <clears throat> Lotus 123 was going great guns. Everybody was using it. It was a far great improvement over anything before. Borland saw a market opportunity. But they also recognized that because everybody knows Lotus 123, if they have to create an entirely new set of commands, an entirely new set of interfaces, nobody will buy it. Look at the education I'm going to have to go through. So they went out and they put out their own. This case went to the Court of Appeals for the First Circuit that sits here in Boston. It found that Lotus's menus and the like were, quote, uncopyrightable methods of operation. And one judge said, you know, it probably is also fair use. Let's go forward to last year. Now a copyright case goes to the Federal Circuit. 
that was created in 82 to hear all patent type of cases. How did it get this one? Because originally there was a patent infringement claim tied to it. Google copied 37 Java packages. <laughs> District court held, eh. Okay. But it's a method of operation. Federal Circuit reversed. It's not a method of operation. All of this sequence stuff, this isn't a method of operation. This is the type of thing that copyright originally intended to create or protect sonnets in Venus to Milo, obviously covers because it's not useful, query. Send it back to district court. Is it fair use? Jury said yes. Most unusually, as it doesn't happen very often, the Court of Appeals said no, and if you read their language here, no reasonable jury could conclude that this was insignificant. Where does that leave you if you're trying to build a competitive product? Where does that leave you if you're trying to build a product that will even interface with an existing one that's out there? People really wonder. People are always, in the business I understand, always thought that APIs were simply tools of the trade that anybody could use. Query. Under Oracle, that's precisely what got Java or Google into trouble. This will be headed for the Supreme Court. It almost has to be. But frankly, how the Supreme Court's going to treat it is unclear. But it's a great big red flag for anybody who's out there in the software business writing software in terms of to what extent can you use what's in existing programs if you want to compete with them or frankly if you want to be able to talk to them. Let's switch gears a little. <clears throat> we now know basically what copyrights and trade secrets and trademarks are supposed to do. What's an investor going to look for? Because if you're starting a company you are going to want investors. Gutenberg wanted investors. He had trouble finding them, but he wanted investors. They're basically going to look for the same things that you should. Who are you? How good's your team? Do you have a track record? And they're going to look, that's looking at you. And they're also going to look at the other side of the coin. How big is this market? Who's in it already? And how long is it going to take you to get there? continuing to look at you. What's your technology? Is it enough for you to do what you want to do? And is it all yours? Do you license some in, which means maybe license to other people who want to compete with you? And they're going to look at what's your IP? What are your copyrights? What are your trade secrets? What are your patents and patent applications? Those may be less important to them than most of us think, at least those of us who spent years trying to write patent applications and to get paid for it. Because at least at the early stage, it's extraordinarily difficult to figure out how valuable a particular patent application is. Because at the early stage, you rarely know what the final commercial product is going to look like. You may not even know clearly what is any competitive product, anybody in this market, what's it going to have to do? That changes a little. You often will have a very imperfect understanding of what's out there in prior art that would limit any claim that you might get. So someone who just looks at your patent applications is going to not be able to really tell how much will these really potentially protect and affect the market. And they don't know the stage of development of your product, and they don't know what the prior art looks like. Far and away, the most important thing to a potential investor, and to you, is are you going to be able to sell that? Because if you can't, you've got a lot of work that may well have gone for naught. What's up here now is sort of a combination of a lot of lists I saw in 50 or so years of practice of what companies looked for when they were going out to buy or invest in a company. And it really breaks down into two categories. First off, they were looking at what, heaven's name, is your technology 
And how are you going to use it? What are your key products? What are the key features? How does the IP for those perhaps relate to them? Then they start looking at the other side of the coin, competitors. Nasty word, but they're always there. And if you're successful, there'll be new ones that will show up. What do they have? Not only in the market situation, but what do they have in the way of patents that might cause you trouble going forward? Copyrights and trade secrets you can probably deal with. If you're careful about who you hired and what they brought with them, if you're careful about what sources of written materials people use, those you can deal with. But you're never going to know what all patents look like. And you're never going to know what pending patents are going to look like because everything changes. So your due diligence wants to know what the patents look like. They want to know how they overlap with what you might have. They have a long list of the IP risks. Is there going to be litigation? What's it going to cost? What's the chances of winning? Might we be enjoined? Any potential for settlement? What are you doing to mitigate this list? And last on this list is give me a list of your patents, trademarks, and patent applications. <clears throat> and most people, companies looking to buy, they may not be quite ordered in this way, but they aren't at the top of the list. I've had a lot of deals in which the other side came in and looked at, wanted to talk about their patents. What did they want to talk about, the patents they were buying? They wanted to make sure there was a file that corresponded to every patent or patent application they've been told about. Did the people who come in have any ability at all to evaluate the substance of those? No. Did they even try? Not at that stage. Maybe somebody back in the back room did, but they certainly didn't when they were first looking at it. Most important, and this ought to be very clear to everybody on third-party claims and why people look at it, what's the effect on your business if you're sued? For a startup or a small company, it's disaster. Because win or lose, and you can never assume or guarantee you won't lose. At best, you're usually playing between the 40-yard lines, and frankly, even in the best case, you're still down in the red zone, and you don't know what's going to happen there. Your key people will be tied up. Your management will be tied up. And you're having to focus on all kinds of things that aren't going to be helpful for your business. Even winning comes at a cost. Litigation is expensive. And it's also, as indicated, very uncertain. If you can get out of potential litigation by changing something or a license that isn't too expensive, it's something that is nearly always really worth considering. Who's most likely to sue you? A competitor, obviously. They're looking at the same market that you are. A prior employer of somebody who's now working for you, particularly if you're now doing exactly what they were planning to do, and they are darn right certain that the only reason you're doing it is because that guy who used to work for us and planned our business plan took it all to you. And what you have to also remember is you may not get sued on your entire system. Often there are key components. Somebody may have a patent on those components. If you buy that component from them, everything's absolutely fine. If you make it yourself or go buy it from a competitor, they may be unhappy. Kind of key here is look at the pieces when you're looking at who might sue you. Don't focus only on the entire system or product that you're putting out. How do you reduce risks? Talked about it before. Know where you got your technology. Avoid using something that might, and I'll underline might. You can't be sure it belongs to somebody else, but if it might, why walk into a hornet's nest when you can walk around it? Is there, if you see somebody else's patent that's got a problem, or you know if they're doing something because you've heard it through the grapevine, can you design in a way that does not adversely affect your product line, but basically avoids what they think is really important? If you can lower the temperature and avoid the direct on clash, you've gone a long way toward reducing the risk that you're going to be sued. What change might avoid and reduce this risk? 
And then there are always searches. What might a search tell you? It'll tell you prior art. That's important not only to can you get a patent, but it's also important in evaluating what somebody else's patent might cover and frankly what you may be able safely to do because it isn't a new idea of anybody else's, but it's prior art. You have to keep track of what the competitions, patents, and patent applications are. This takes some time, it takes some money, but it's largely available online, at least it become available online 18 months after patent applications have been filed. But if you trace those, you will get an idea of what they think is important, what they're trying to cover, and you may also get a hint as to what they're not. Keep in mind when you do this that if the competitor is as smart as you are, and you better assume that they are, they will keep some patent applications pending so that they can monkey them around a little to cover what they think you're doing, even if that isn't what they tried to do in the first place. And don't forget completely about non-competitor patents, particularly if they cover an important component of something that you're doing in your overall system. What about searches? Rarely do you need one for a trade secret. If it's out there and you can find it on a search, which you do in litigation, it just proves the trade secret is invalid. They're important for trademarks, both in terms of you choosing a good one offensively for yourself, but also making sure that you don't tread on anybody else. And this is a big deal search. It's not limited to what's a registered trademark in the US. There are companies who spend a lot of money. You can do some online. You can do a fairly decent search online. But if you're really putting your whole thought, and this is the mark I'm going to use, it's usually worth spending some extra money to get a professional search done. Because the last thing in the world you want to do six months or a year into the game is find that everything you've invested into promoting this mark has to be thrown away and you have to start from scratch again. Patents is where searches are usually conducted. And there are really three types. <clears throat> There's a so-called patentability search. That is what you will do before you file a patent application. It is, quite honestly, cheap and dirty. It's focused on what do you think is new about what you're doing, but it gives you some idea of what's out there. If you are a real expert in the field and you know all the relevant technology, or think you do, and you probably don't, you may be able to get by without it. It's typically worthwhile doing. What your investor and what your marketing guys are going to look for is, OK, this is what we want to do. Are there existing patents that I might infringe? And these are very, very rarely the same patents that you'd find or want to look at in the patentability search. Because they're all earlier. Presumably, you put something on top of this cake on what you might infringe. You're getting under the frosting or the jimmies on the frosting. You're down in the middle of the cake itself. The focus here is nearly always on infringement. Why? Basically, because it's a lot easier not to prove that you don't infringe than it is to prove that somebody else's patent is invalid. And it's easier for a couple of reasons, one of which is what are the presumptions, the other of which is who bears the burdens of proof, and we'll touch base on that farther than we get going. If you really know about a patent that's a problem, then you go full-blown into a validity search. Do you have a chance that assumes probably you're not going to be able to design around it? What do you do? And you can make the decision, and it sometimes is the right one to make, you know, this is a toss-up. Why don't I invest my money somewhere else? Biggest problem on searches, none of them are complete. There are, we just issued the 10 millionth US patent. My guess is the better part of half of those are still valid. Heaven knows how many are still valid in foreign countries, in foreign countries with markets that you care about. And there's 18 months of pending patent applications you can't find out about because there won't be anything published or available for 18 months. You're never going to find anything. You're going to have to make judgments as to how much can I spend on this search. If I'm a patent attorney, I'm perfectly willing to let you spend 
as much as you want to, or right, maybe convince you to, but that's a bad decision to spend too much from your company's point of view. <clears throat> You've all heard about opinions. Oh, I'll get an opinion. Two typical types are patentability, can I get a patent? Non-infringement, do I infringe? Validity, they're expensive. And they get more expensive as you get toward validity. You said the patentability is fairly cheap. And they're usually uncertain. You can't treat them as an insurance policy. And at least on the litigation side, they're only useful when they're wrong. Because on the litigation side, what you're after is an opinion that says, oh, that guy's patent is invalid or I don't infringe it. When does that be important? After a judge jury is found that it is valid and you do infringe it because now it will reduce your damages. Use opinions not simply to, maybe to gauge risk, not as a guarantee, but it may be useful in business planning because people will look at things that otherwise you might not. You may be able to reduce an investor's concerns. You may decide, gee, if I make this change, what would reduce the chances of getting sued? And it may give you some sense of where and might be a potential for settling this darn thing before I frankly destroy my fledgling company that's running out of money. So summing up, what's your IP strategy? Goal, use your technology and it's new. By now, it's fairly clear technology and IP are very different to make money. Some IP and some agreements can help you. They won't guarantee, but they can help you achieve those goals. You can prevent your employees, hopefully, from stealing your trade secrets. You may be able to prevent other people from copying your product, and you certainly can prevent Brother Leo from selling that translation to somebody else or, frankly, make you perhaps making a new one. You can make sure that there aren't two people using Cadillac for automobiles, if you happen to be one of them. And make you more attractive to an inventor. But the bottom line is, remember and always remember, IP cannot give you the right to use your technology. It can't give you the right to make and sell your technology. Your technology is what may gives you that ability. And the most important thing to you as a company and to investor is you should be able to use that technology free of third-party claims. The right patent might help you out more than copyrights, trademarks, or trade secrets do. So the next session, we're going to take a look at what is a patent, what can it do for you, what can't it do for you, and really it turns it into a cost-benefit analysis. When is it useful? Thanks. Thanks, Jim, for getting us off to what I think was a terrific start. Uh, let's talk a bit about where we go from here. The overarching format of this program is that we're going to alternate lecture sessions, like the one you had today, with question and answer sessions. About two weeks from now, Jim will be back, and he will spend an hour answering questions that you have submitted using the link that you can see now on your screen. Please get your questions in within the next week, and that will give Jim time to go over them and think about his responses. Once again, thank you, Jim. Thank you to all of you folks out there for your participation. Look forward to being connected with you again in about two weeks.